I think live na tayo. Hello, good afternoon sa lahat. To our 12 viewers, 13 as of the moment, ganang hapon. Hi, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Good evening. In three minutes, we will be starting our technical webinar for this day. So I hope you guys, your friends, you can invite uh, fellow Piche, UAE. May I request uh, everyone also, except the moderator, to mute their Zoom. So we're already 17. Hello, magandang hapon.
Magandang alo. Hello, we're getting many na po. Hello to our friends from the Philippines. Welcome. Thank you sa pagpunta. Thank you for sparing your time with us. Let's uh, give uh, five minutes, Doms, uh, if it's okay, okay to everyone to start. Kasi dumadami yung sa waiting room. Eh. Let's okay. just okay. let them in. So let's wait for five minutes more. Our distinguished speakers also in the meeting room already. Hello, sir. Magandang hapon. Uh, good evening, Engineer Walter. Good evening. Hapon pa ata sa Pinas, 4 p.m. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Checking my audio. Narinig naman ako, no? Yes, Chris. Okay. Loud and clear. Tama? Loud and clear. Okay. Yes, dumadami na tayo. Nakakatuwa naman. Yeah. Yan. Remind din natin sila, Chris, na stream din tayo sa Facebook siguro. Yes, of course. We're also live. We're also streaming live via our official Facebook page, which is Piche UAE Chapter. You can check it out. Uh, it's at Piche UAE, it's handle name. So you can share it. So we are streaming live po doon din sa ating mga friends hindi nakapasok sa Zoom. And if they want to take part of this uh, technical webinar, they can watch it live through FB. At Piche UAE. The PCA UAE chapter official Facebook page. Maganda na rin if you give it a thumbs up, a like. Para updated kayo parate sa ating uh, news and latest uh, yun na, latest news sa ating uh, UAE chapter PCA. Once again, thank you sa ating uh, Maraming participants ngayon. Mag more than 30 participants na tayo as of the moment. Magandang hapon, magandang gabi. Once again, thank you, thank you sa pag-spare ng oras mo dito. It's an honor to be with you guys. After you. Rest assured, we'll be issuing certificate of attendance uh, by the end of the seminar or within the days to come. So just uh, uh, finish this uh, webinar no? so that you will receive the certificate of attendance. Programs will be effect effective 
Hello. So ayan po, requesting everyone to mute themselves for as of the moment kung pwede lang. So except mod the moderator and the uh, creator of this meeting room. So ayan. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Okay, I think we're good to go. Hello, everyone. Parang kakaiba to, ang tahimik lang, no? I can only hear myself. Good afternoon, good evening sa lahat. Welcome uh, to our fellow Piche members in UAE and uh, across the globe from the Philippines. Maayong hapon, maayong gabi sa atong tanan. It's good to see you through your virtual camera sa mga my cameras dyan. So, Nakikita ko kayo. You look dashing and beautiful, pero alam ko nakashort pa rin kayo. So, today we are going to conduct the 10th installment of the Piche UAE Technical Webinar. So, this is already the 10th, second this year. So, we are proud in behalf of the Piche UAE chapter. We are proud that we are continuing to promote and advocate learning through this technical webinar. So, ayan. But before anything else, we would like to request everyone for a prayer. May I call on Engineer Alan D, our current treasurer of the Piche UAE, to lead us to a prayer. Engineer Alan D, are you there? Hello? So, ayan. I think we're, are we online? Can you hear me, Paul? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, great. yes. Yeah. Ayan. So let's just, uh, I think na disconnect lang si Alan. So. Ah, okay. So, sige. Uh, before we uh, we do the prayer, no? We would just like remind to remind everyone to stay muted for uh, this session para lang sa kalinawan ng ating uh, ating webinar for this afternoon. Once again, we are so blessed and we are honored that we had a speaker, a distinguished speaker this afternoon, which will be talking about chemical engineers at the forefront of disaster resilience and economic recovery. So ayan, aabangan po natin yan. Uh, can we check on Engineer Alan D? Is he online already? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Chris. Uh, hello, hello. Engineer Alan D. Hello. So ayan. Uh, before we start, we formally start this webinar. Can we ask you to lead us to a prayer? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay lang ba kung hindi ko na i-on yung camera? Kasi medyo nagkakaproblema ako sa technicality. No? It's okay. So no problem. Uh, your presence is really appreciated. Okay. Okay. Let's start. Okay. So let's uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord, salamat po sa... Uh, oras na ito na binigyan niyo sa amin and uh, thank you Lord for this webinar that we are able to uh, participate. Salamat din po sa mga mga participants. Sana po uh, maging attentive lang po kami and meron po kaming panibagong matututunan for this webinar. Uh, I pray also for uh, sa speaker na sana po mag-share may share niya yung wisdom sa amin and Uh, magamit po namin ito sa sa uh, sa time na ito god na na binigyan niyo sa amin and we continue to uh, lift up to you everything and bring back all the praise and glory to you uh, in jesus name we pray amen amen okay thank you engineer uh, our speaker is actually in the meeting room now can we uh, can i ask him to say hi for all of us let's just check his audio because he's from uh, he's all the way from the Philippines. Let's just check his system. Hello? 
Engineer uh, M. Nase. Are you there? Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening uh, for those who are in other parts of the globe. Ayan. I'm nice here. And... I'm happy to be with you. Mm -mm. Okay. All the way from the all of, all the way from the Philippines, Jerry Nase. Thank you, thank you. I can hear you loud and clear. Ayan. So, but uh, before anything else, also in behalf of Piche UAE and the officers, we would like to thank everyone for sparing uh, you for sparing your time with us this afternoon. We are blessed uh, to seeing you this afternoon, fellow chemical engineers, and taking part in cultivating information about our role in this society from the past in the present and the not so distant future. Let this be a chance for us to step up and grow. I must just, I just might quote this from an American author. No, um, the capacity to learn is a gift, to learn is a skill, and the willingness to learn is a choice. Now, we now move on to the opening webinar, uh, webinar guidelines, okay? And uh, uh, I think you can show, uh, you can see it in the screen, in front of you, our webinar guidelines. I shall read it to you. Uh, with, I shall read it. So first, all participants except for the moderator and the speakers must remain muted throughout the webinar except when asked or necessary. You can type in your questions in the chat box anytime during or after the presentation. So questions will be entertained during the open forum later. At times, anonymous polls will be launched. So uh, be alert because uh, there, might, there might be a polls that might uh, uh, pop out and anytime we encourage you to get engaged. This is important also. Certificates will be issued to attendees upon completion of the online evaluation. So there is an online evaluation which, be, will, which will be shared later after the webinar. No, this is a type of an assessment form. And with this, we can issue you your uh, certificate of attendance. Link will be shared in the chat box and FB page. By the way, we are streaming live in FB page. Check it out. Picha UAE chapter, the official Facebook page of the Picha UAE chapter. It's at Picha UAE, and handle name natin. For any assistance, please direct your message to the host or moderator through the chat box. Ayan. So let's move on. The highlight of this event, which is our technical webinar. We shall introduce an, our distinguished speaker for this afternoon. So Kababayan Kopato from Cebu. So hello uh, to our speaker, which is the currently AVP, the head of the process of excellence in process excellence in Manila Water Services Incorporated. He is an entrepreneur owning and operating various businesses. He grew his career with Procter & Gamble for 24 years, serving as director, initiatives delivery leader, and PH, uh, Philippine QA leader in his last eight years with the company. He is also a recipient of various Power of You individual awards for excellence in project management, successful focused improvements, and more. He earned his BS Chemical Engineering from the University of San Carlos in Cebu, graduating magna cum laude. Wow. He also placed six in the CHE licensure board exam. So let's welcome our distinguished speaker for this afternoon, Engineer Walter M. Nase. Hello, sir. Maayong hapon. Maayong hapon, Chris. Good Hello. afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, yes. Can you see me? Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. Malinaw po, sir. Let me share my screen. Well, I think my problem yata sa video mo, we can't see you. Are you able to see my slides now? Yes. Yes. Again, thank you, Chris, for that nice introduction. Uh, let me try my best to live up to, the, to our audience's uh, expectations. Engineer Hilbert Libres, uh, PGUA Chapter President, 
uh, my uh, fellow chemical engineers, guests, and friends. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you for Engineer the... Wally, sorry. Uh, yes, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think we can see your video. My... I'm not sure if there's a the problem. Male and female are same or not. I hope that you agree or not. Now, tell me, guys. The I subject. Yeah. Should, should I stop my video? Can you see yeah. my slide? We yeah. can see your slide, uh, but we water, can't see your video. Are we supposed to see your face through this uh, with this within this seminar? Are we supposed to see your uh, face? Yes, I actually uh, okay. turned on my video already. So let me uh, toggle it off and on. So uh, okay, again. Uh, can you see me now? Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> we can see you now. Okay, that's good. So if if it's all right, uh, may I proceed? Yes, sure, sir. All right. So as I was saying, I, I would like to thank you for this great honor of being able to talk my mind in front of esteemed uh, professionals here today. More than two weeks ago, Gilbert sent me a chat inviting me to partake as a speaker in this webinar as part of your PGUAE technical webinars program. I was at first hesitant, given that for technical matters, I would only be able to share general stuff considering our current and previous company's confidentiality clause on trade secrets. But when scope was clarified to include leadership and how to perform our key roles, I gladly said yes. We both believe in the value of learning, sharing, and continuing professional development. And I thought that being able to introduce myself to this community in UAE would be a worthwhile network expansion as well. So here I am re ready to share with you a talk I made last year in another PG chapter on chemical engineers at the forefront of disaster resilience and economic recovery. You may note that this was our theme in 2020 Chemical Engineers Week, but I thought it could still be a worthy topic given that one, my message here is self-developed and hence may still be unique for, versus those that you have heard of. Second, uh, many of you may have not been able to join this, the said event. And lastly, we are still in the pandemic and economic, economic recovery is still yet to be seen. Hence, this would be this should still be a relevant talk. So if I may, I would like to present my thoughts on three areas to dissect the topic. The first, chemical engineers. The second circle, leadership. Third, disaster resilience and economic recovery. And finally, for the intersection across these three circles, I would like to share with you as well a few tips for us to live through this economic recovery that we are up now. The prospective one regarding post-COVID crisis. I probably would focus more on the recovery than on the disaster because of the positive note it shall bring. Much like it's better to see the light at the end of the tunnel than to explore the dark tunnel itself. It is my hope that I could be able to cultivate into enthusiasm in you in working towards the light. Now on the first circle, let me talk about chemical engineers. I guess this will be the shortest and easiest one since practically all of us, I think, are chemical engineers here. And no, I wouldn't dwell on the history of chemical engineering, the knowledge of chemical engineers and what they do in their profession. That would be like teaching chess how to cook. Instead, I want to, to fetch insights from the characteristics of chemical engineers upon which we can draw strength of being forefront in disaster resilience and economic recovery. First, sorry, is that is the slide being blocked by the uh, by the control panel? I think it's okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, take up the ribbon. Anyway, uh, first, uh, chemical engineers are versatile. 
Consider Tony Tan Tak Chong, a Filipino multi-billionaire, Dan Santa Maria, who bought the UCC uh, Vicar, Xi Jinping, of course, President uh, of the People's Republic of China, and Dolph Lundgren, the movie actor. Consider their diversity. Tony is a Filipino billionaire businessman. He is the founder and chairman of Jollibee Foods Corporation and the company chairman of Double Dragon Properties. Tan started with an ice cream parlor in 1975 with his wife and subsequently founded Jollibee. Acquisition of Greenwich Pizza Corp enabled him to enter the pizza pasta segment. In early 2006, Jollibee Foods Corporation bought out the remaining shares of its partners in Greenwich Pizza Corporation, equivalent to a 20% stake for $384 million in cash. As of August 2008, Hans Jollibee has a total of 1,480 stores worldwide, including Jollibee, Red Ribbon, Chow King, Greenwich, and Mang Inasar. As of November 2015, Forbes estimated his net worth at uh, 4.1 billion US dollars. Then came Double Dragon Properties. In 2012, Tan, through his holding company, Honey Star Holdings Corporation, invested in Injap Land Corporation, a property company founded by Ed Garcia II. With Tan's entry, the company was renamed Double Dragon Properties Corporation. Tony's current net worth is now estimated at around 100 billion uh, Philippine pesos, making him among the few Filipinos in the world USD billionaires. Monsignor Dan was awarded to USD Hall of Fame in 2019 for his community service. He was the Baha'i Pari Credit Cooperative co-founder and general manager Solidaritas Funds Company co-founder and president, and at the same time, the diocese of Cubao by Car General. So three roles in one. He had taught skills such as soap making to his unemployed parishioners. He do not only make themselves economically viable, he also give dignity to themselves. He left a lucrative industry practice to enter the priesthood at age 36. He was ordained in 1986 by his eminence, I mean, uh, Cardinal Sin, and Monsignor Dan is the author of the books, The Mystery of the Trinity in Christian Life and A Day in the Life of a Parish Priest. Well, you know Xi Jinping, right? He is the current president of the world's strongest country if we count his countrymen, and arguably the world's strongest economy as well. If you are fond of Rocky also, you would have known Dolph Lundgren, who co-starred with Stallone as his Russian opponent boxer who was as strong as a rock. Quite a spread of diversity, right? But all of them are chemical engineers. Sorry. Sorry, uh, there's a poll here. Should I just close it? Okay. Tony graduated in 1975, uh, Monsignor Dan 1964, Xi Jinping 1975, uh, 1979 rather, and Lon Green, uh, Bachelor in 1980 and Master in 1982 from University of Sydney. Hence, chemical engineers are indeed versatile. They can fit into situations and perform or even excel in there. You can also consider the spread of where chemical engineers work. Zipia recently presented their statistics of US chemical engineers and shown uh, among 20,103 uh, professionals that uh, chemical engineers can pretty much work in any industries. May it be in manufacturing, technology, professional, construction, healthcare, finance, education, or what have we. 
even if I look at our current assignment profile in Manila, you would see a versatile spread of uh, chemical engineers from the business focus in finance and business development to the operations focus in water supply operations, what, wastewater management division and supply chain management. From the marriage of general management and technical consultancy in office of the president where I am reporting to, to the systems management in cash. <clears throat> From designing and constructing in program management division to maintaining and improving this in integrated assets management. Truly chemical engineers are versatile and can deliver value almost to anything. Second, we chemical engineers are methodical. We have been trained to never stray away from the four point structure in problem solving of capturing all givens, be particular to determine what's required, to skillfully navigate the solution and to summarize the answer and put it within a box. I recall one of my professors, Engineer Blase, who was the chairwoman of the department then in University of San Carlos, when I was yet a student, she said, always, always put these four parts in your problem solving and you'll, you'll see you would never be zero in a test, even in board exam. <laughs> I'm not sure about you, but uh, this is really how we do each problem we are given uh, in uh, chemical engineering exams in, uh, in San Carlos at that time. We are methodical. We would be bringing our very long rulers, French corbs, and tape together graphing papers, and we would be solving distillation problems through a thorough step-by-step -step procedure, remember? Well, probably the new chemical engineers now could just be punching in the prep C20 software or in Thermoox or in Smart Process TM. But when we solve fractionations and uh, distillation manually, chemical engineers methodically plot the saturation curves, draw lagerized steps from the starting concentration to the desired one, and count the steps to represent the desired number of stages. Or how about this? Instead of drawing an unknown straight line between two states in a psychrometric chart, we would rather take a long detour across different points to ensure the lines are known and solvable and thereby the overall unknown becomes also solvable. Truly, we are methodical and we do not buckle down in front of the unknown. Chemical engineers are problem solvers. It is easy to reflect this from our history. We recall that the field of chemical engineering was first conceived following when Leblanc process was discovered. Recall that the discovery was Leblanc's response to the King's call in 1775 to solve the soda ash availability problem after imports were refused to be served. He fashioned a sequence of reactions and thus processes from table salt into soda ash which has of higher value to society from its derived benefits in textiles of making sopra food and more. And after the solution solved the problem at the time, a subsequent problem of dead trees and animals around soda ash plants were observed. Subsequently, another chemical engineer by heart also came up with tall carbonating towers on what would be known now as falling film reactors, continuously producing soda ash from ammoniated brine against carbon dioxide and free from the hazardous byproducts inherent in the original Leblanc process. I'm sure you can find it in your experience a situation where you can say, we chemical engineers are problem solvers. In my case, I recall from my previous employer observing a high level of defects in our blue tide and Mr. Clean bars, in that the color consistency would often go outside our, our specifications, hence the need for rework or even scrapping the batch. 
both cost and supply would take a hit then because we would never risk quality even if it is just about appearance. What I did was roll up my sleeves and examine the boundary regions of slurry flow for the particular dye pigment mixture. We established uh, as true my hypothesis that uh, some dye pigments were settling from the flow and at times we picked up again, characterizing a saltation flow. We simply increased velocity and eliminated dead legs and bingo, saved cost and maintained supply. Indeed, chemical engineers are problem solvers. Lastly, chemical engineers are producers. Let's take a look at these three chemical engineers who were awarded prize in 2019. Helping farmers <clears throat> is an advocacy of Dr. Rex Limafilis, a professor and a chemical engineer. When the planting of sugar cane was reduced in Negros Occidental, a lot of farmers lost their jobs, which meant less to no income for their families. Championing projects on alternative energy, he introduced sweet sorghum as a substitute crop to be planted in some areas in Sagai City. With the backing of the local government, hundreds of sugar cane farmers were given jobs through his project, which at the same time provided a more sustainable source of raw material for ethanol production. Chemical engineer against poverty. Poverty alleviation through job creation is also uh, Dr. Evelyn Tabuada's ulterior motive in conducting her research. Seeing an opportunity from the tons of mango waste being crushed by local factories, Dr. Tabuada spearheaded a team of researchers and engineers who worked on converting this waste into high value products such as flour, animal feed, and pectin. <clears throat> the success of the research paved the way for them to conduct and construct a processing plant, which now employs several individuals who used to pick garbage for a living. An engineer in wastewater treatment caring for the environment is Dr. Merlinda Palencia's advocacy. Aside from being a chemical engineer and an educator, she also uh, she is also the proponent of uh, vigormin, a powder-like su substance which helps clean wastewater before introducing it back to bodies of water. She has been involved in the successful rehabilitation of Boracay through her partnership with NGOs and private foundations. Not only that we produce solutions in research and development, we do produce goods in manufacturing and we produce beautiful outcomes from the process. At this point, let us switch gear and talk about leadership. If we talk of being at the forefront, no topic is more important than about leadership. I intend to tackle in the next 30 minutes the most, uh, the most holistic 5E model of leadership to which envision energize, enable, engage, and execute. Now, I am not claiming to be a great leader. Like you all, I am also a student of leadership, reading books, talking about concepts in groups, and trying to experience firsthand how to be a leader in the various roles I have fulfilled. So I think it is just right that we approach the subsequent topic from the frame of mind of great leaders. First, envision. From Wayne Gretzky, he said, skate to where the pack is going, not to where it's been. Wayne is a Canadian former professional ice hockey player and former head coach. He played 20 years in the National Hockey League and was nicknamed the Great One. He has been called the greatest hockey player ever by many sports writers, players, and the NHL itself. Gretzky is the league, leading scorer in uh, National Hockey League history with more goals and assists than any other player. He was born and raised in Canada where he honed his skills at a backyard rink and regularly played minor hockey at a level far above his peers. 
Despite his unimpressive stature, strength, and speed, Gretzky's intelligence and reading of the game were unrivaled. He was adept at dodging checks from opposing players and cons consistently anticipated where the puck was going to be and executed the right move at the right time. Gretzky became known for setting up behind his opponent's net, an area that was needed to get teased. Gretzky puts lots of credence when he says, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. In leadership, envisioning is often quoted first. There is no better way to begin but with the end in mind, right? Chemical engineers must have the ability to paint a desired picture of the future, either taking the organization to paint it with him together and or communicating a picture such that the organization can picture it themselves. In the upcoming economic recovery, there is nothing more important than to be able to see clearly the light at the end of the tunnel. We have to see it in our mind like we are already living on it. We must diffuse the, the same positive vision to the people we interface. Otherwise, we can't be leaders but only thinkers. And we must converge all our effort to go where the vision is. Energize. John Robert Wooden was an American basketball player and coach, nicknamed the, Net, the Wizard of Westwood. He won 10 NCAA national championships in a 12-year period as head coach for the UCLA Bruins. Inclusive of a <clears throat> record feat of seven in a row, no other team has won more than four consecutive championships in the league. Wooden was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame as a player in 1960 and as a coach in 1973, the first person ever enshrined in both categories. His biggest secret, both as a point guard and a coach, is his belief that the most powerful leadership tool one, ha one has is his own self as an example. That's why when John talked of discipline, he showed it rather than described it. When asking for teamwork, he spare led than talk about it. And when he asked his team to deliver points, he ran fast, sprung, and made the layup in front of uh, much taller defenders. In leading, chemical engineers must energize the organization, and the best way to do this is to role model. Enable. Jack Welch is a GE's General Electric CEO and Chairman from 1981 to 2001. He led GE consistently in the Fortune 500 companies. True to his quotation, before you are a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is about growing others. Jack Welch institutionalized in GE the Six Sigma program, requiring his key leaders along with the whole organization, a journey of capability growth from practitioner as yellow belt to green, black, and master black belt. He sharpened the focus on customer satisfaction and efficiency as a result with such enablement. Enabling is always a key role of a leader it is about ensuring the organization is equipped to face the challenges at hand. Let us please scan what we need in this economic recovery. Let's enable ourselves and our teams with capabilities for digital collaboration and for the objective focus mindset to tackle the unprecedented way we work nowadays. Enabling is investing in each of us so my so we might become more effective and thus harvest the gains as investment returns. Engage. Stephen Covey is a great author of personal development and leadership books. He wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective Individuals, Speed of Trust, and, uh, and uh, lately the Eighth Habit as well. He said interdependence is a higher value than independence. Well, in his book, Seven Habits, he, he talked about three layers between dependence, independence, and interdependence. 
interdependence drives win-win, and that's what, what, what we want. When leading, we really need to espouse collaboration across many people in order to be successful. You would find later how, how much this means in leading resiliency and recovery. Execute, of course, Steve Jobs, who said, to me, ideas are worth nothing unless executed. They are just a multiplier. Execution is worth millions. I probably don't have to introduce who Steve Jobs is. So I would rather just uh, share uh, a, key, uh, a few concepts about execution. This is the work that makes things happen. This is the battleground, so to speak. Execution, that is. Second, while in execution, a leader must be keen to observe any indicators which can prompt the need for adjustments. Because we know, <clears throat> even though we have plans and we, we are just executing the plans, while we do need to observe the discipline to follow the plan, there could be external prompts, external triggers that could uh, require us to adjust our plans and uh, uh, respond accordingly. Third, the environment when executing is dynamic, hence a leader must always think on his feet. It's kind of connected to the uh, second one, but here, uh, this talks about the speed of decision-making, the bias for action, the bias to provide the decision so that the whole organization doesn't wait. Finally, a leader should manage commitments, clearly specifying the deliverables, the person assigned, and the date it is due. Let's now switch gears again, and this time tackle the third circle disaster resilience and economic recovery. I shall try to tackle the general sense of the concept coming from <clears throat> coming from a general context of disasters and then later on tackle that which is in front of us today, the economic recovery from COVID-19 crisis. In general, economic recovery is the business cycle stage following a recession that is characterized by a sustained period of improving business activity. Normally, during an economic recovery, GDP grows, incomes rise, and unemployment falls as the economy rebounds. It is best understood if we couple the understanding with, with what comes before it. Hence, let's take a moment to understand various disaster, disasters we must recover from. Of course, there, there would be natural uh, uh, disasters, there would be man-made uh, disasters. And if we scan the news, uh, we would uh, have heard about fires in Australia, India, and California, floods in Indonesia, cyclone, uh, cyclone Amphan in India and Bangladesh, Earthquake in Philippines, Turkey, etc. Local storms in East Africa, India, and Asia. The Taal eruption in Philippines. The ongoing wars and the global COVID-19. There are almost all of the this type of disasters uh, I have seen uh, firsthand in the Philippines except probably uh, the wildfires. Now let's look at some numbers. The left tabulated chart is from the United Nations Office of Disaster Risk Reduction published this year, sharing disaster statistics, excluding COVID per disaster type, comparing 2020 versus the previous years. The first chart indicates the number of occurrence, the second is for the number of deaths, and the last one shows the number of affected people. The right side is showing the current COVID statistics from Statista, extracting the data from John Hopkins as of 15th of this month, as of yesterday, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> Let me cite some insights. First, 
disasters vary in degree. Ex-COVID disasters, excluding COVID, I mean, recorded uh, disasters recorded to affect 201 million people a year, a number already surpassed by the COVID pandemic alone. On the average, excluding COVID disasters result to 61,709 deaths a year, while we have already close to 4.9 million deaths from COVID in 1.5 years. Truly, disasters vary in degree. Secondly, likelihood and impact need to be both examined per disaster type, likelihood and impact. Floods tend to occur a lot, averaging 163 per year, and affect more people, averaging 82.3 million per year. But excluding COVID, <clears throat> it is earthquakes that cause more deaths at 36,066 average per year. When planning for resilience, this would be key fact, uh, this would be key to factor in the factor of likelihood and the factor of impact. Third, a disaster impact may greatly vary per region. While this could be genes related, it is more likely because of capability and of response. Hence, emergency response program certainly helps. If you look at the table on the right, the global death per million population uh, ratio is now 625 as of yesterday. The worst ones show over four, five times than uh, five times than uh, than this global uh, number, so ranging from 3,000 to 6,000. While the while the best ones a mere five percent. 5% of this 625, range, ranging from 3 to 9. A bit happy to note that both here in the Philippine, Philippines and there in, uh, in the UAE, we see lower deaths per population than the world. Now on disaster resilience. U.S. National Academy of Sciences in their publication titled Disaster Resilience, a National Imperative, defined disaster resilience as the ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, and uh, more successfully adapt to adverse events. When we think of disaster resilience, there are at least a couple of major thought areas. One is how to, ma how to manage one disaster resilience per se. And secondly, how to influence the community to go for it, to, to gun for resiliency. For the former, let me share this resilience model on the left of the slide. For the latter, let me share the Sendai framework that the United Nations is driving towards. For the resilience model, the core really is about assessing the hazards and the risks. Remember our discussion a while ago when we talk about uh, looking at the likelihood and the impact. Look, uh, evaluating that, that is really part of the continuous uh, work, continuous studies about assessing hazards and risks. And uh, coming from such knowledge, we build three, uh, a three-step approach of preparedness, response, and recovery preparedness, response, and recovery, and it goes in cycles. In preparedness, the first step is to prevent, actually, if, we, if there's a possibility that we can prevent the disaster from happening. So uh, then part, uh, part here would be like land use planning, right? uh, technical me measures, biological measures, and organizational directives that can actually prevent the uh, disaster to happen. Next would be uh, emergency provisions because uh, some, some things we can't really control, right? Uh, some are really acts of God. So the best thing to do in preparedness is really about emergency provisions. What we mean by this is really to provide uh, the right uh, form of management in case of emergency response. Uh, 
define a warning and alert systems, determining the resources for intervention and to prepare for them, emergency planning, training and exercises, you know, so that we can practice the emergency response, individual preparations and insurance. Now, when the disaster and or is up, we move to the third, uh, uh, third part, which is really the preparations for intervention. So for those, for those of you familiar or uh, still familiar in the Philippines, right? So uh, before the typhoon comes, there would be announcement, announcements about uh, its path, its characteristics, etc. So that would be the, the part here, preparation for intervention early warning and recommendations, and uh, uh, readiness for intervention. Next, the actual intervention itself, because the disaster is already there. So we need to have some uh, types of alerts and instructions how to behave. You know? Because uh, a person has a brain, uh, has a mind, but, uh, but a crowd has only sets of feet so they cannot think uh, together as one. So there has to be an instructions that uh, uh, that can uh, become a drumbeat for them. Then we have to think about the rescue. We have to think about uh, the damage mitigation and the emergency measures. Next uh, is about reconditioning. How can we uh, temporarily we live after the disaster or while in the disaster. So constructions, installations, in enterprise, uh, enterprises, even temporary ones. Energy systems, communications, how do we uh, communicate from each other? Uh, can people still hear news from the radio and television? Supply and disposals, uh, food, uh, you know, uh, portalettes if needed. So that's part of recondition. The subsequent uh, ones is about uh, recovery, event analysis and reconstruction, right? So because uh, in our definition of uh, <clears throat> resilience, we talk about uh, being able to recover from and uh, more successfully adapt to adverse events. So that means to say uh, some steps in the uh, resilience model has to be Present to uh, uh, to make that happen. That's why the the couple of steps uh, from the resilience model uh, starts with the uh, event analysis. Event analysis is a documentation of the event, gathering the lessons learned for preparedness, response, and recovery. The last part is reconstruction. Again, constructing install, installing enterprises. This time. Uh, it, it should be the permanent one. And hopefully we're not just <clears throat> putting back what was used to be there, but instead putting back better, uh, building better so that uh, they don't, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, earthquake, so that the building will not be uh, affected again or uh, be uh, uh, be damaged again once the same magnitude of earthquake happens. So that's resilience model. Now the, the Sindai framework for disaster risk reduction from uh, United Nations Office of Disaster uh, Risk Reduction. So uh, what it is really is a, an agreement across um, uh, multiple nations. Uh, that has uh, been adopted also by others and was, uh, was formulated in Sendai. So the expected outcome is for a substantial reduction of disaster risk and, risk and losses. There are smart, uh, smart goals and clear scope and uh, purpose uh, for the framework. There are seven targets and uh, the targets would be all about uh, reduction of uh, disasters mortality, uh, disaster, uh, 
reduction on uh, the disaster's impact on affected people and uh, reduction on the disaster economic loss in relation to global uh, GDP. So uh, as a clear target, what uh, Sendai framework uh, does is compare the 2005 to 2015 annual results and uh, compare that with uh, 2015, uh, sorry, 2020 to 2030 uh, results. We should be seeing uh, a reduction of the impact of the disasters. Uh, apart from those uh, three, uh, the targets would also include substantially reduced disaster damage to critical infrastructure and disruption of basic services. Another one would be substantially increase the number of countries with national and local disaster risk reduction strategies by 2020. So this is really more about uh, pushing for uh, communities to have the framework for uh, disaster resiliency. Uh, substantially increase the availability of and access to multi-hazard early warning systems and disaster risk information and uh, assessments to people. And lastly, substantially increase the availability of and access to multi-hazard early warning systems and disaster risk information and assessments. So uh, there are actually four priorities of actions. No? Priority one is about understanding disaster risks. Disaster risk management needs to be based on an understanding of disaster risk in all its dimensions of vulnerability, capacity, exposure of persons and assets, hazards, and the environment. Priority two, priority two is about strengthening disaster risk governance to manage disaster risk. Disaster risk governance at the national, regional, and global levels is vital to the management of disaster risk reduction in all sectors and ensuring the coherence of national and local frameworks of laws, regulations, and public policies. Priority three is about investing in disaster risk reduction for resilience. Public and private investment in disaster risk prevention and reduction through structural and non-structural measures are essential to enhance the economic, social, health, and cultural resilience of persons and communities. And the last uh, action is about enhancing disaster preparedness for e effective response, meaning to build back better in recovery, rehabilitation and reconstruction, Experience indicates that disaster preparedness needs to be strengthened for more effective response and ensure capacities are in place for effective recovery. Disasters have also demonstrated that the recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction phase, which needs to be prepared ahead of the disaster, is actually an opportunity to build back better through integrating disaster risk reduction measures. There are a lot of guiding uh, principles actually here uh, under this uh, Sendai framework. Let me just uh, cite a couple, uh, uh, a couple of key ones. First one is that the primary responsibility is really on the state to prevent and reduce disaster risk, including through cooperation. So, uh, so, so Philippines, we, we already have in the RRC, so uh, same, same is true in other countries. No? So the, the, the push really is uh, for the state to, to own the primary responsibility to prevent and reduce disaster risk. Uh, second, there has to be a shared responsibility between central government and national authorities, sectors and stakeholders as appropriate to national circumstances. So again, the key is really engagement and collaboration. So there, there are more, uh, but one good uh, uh, principle to cite is really the build back better, which I have touched a while ago. So build back better for preventing the creation of and reducing existing disaster risk.
All right, so that's a disaster resilience. Moving on, we talk about recovery curves, recovery shapes. Okay. There's actually a lot here about uh, recovery shapes. Uh, there are different models uh, of how we expect recovery from disasters. There would be a V shape, U shape, swoosh, like a Nike, uh, Z shape, shape uh, W and L. What is a V shape economic recovery? V historically, most recoveries have been uh, have been V-shaped with activity returning to pre-recession levels in the same or less time as the duration of the downturn. Unfortunately, the current experience is unlikely to follow this pattern. While the sudden halt uh, to activity associated with national lockdowns triggered a steep descent into recession, the reopening of economies occurred much more gradually, precluding a sharp ascent during the recovery phase that, that characterizes a V-shaped rebound. If the shutdown of the global economy is similar to a light switch being flipped off, the restart will be more like a dimmer switch being gradually turned up. What is a U-shaped economic recovery? The clearest example of a U was the global financial crisis. Over the course of 2008 and 2009, the contraction in real GDP became gradually more pronounced and the subsequent rebound to pre-GFC levels in many countries took years. As noted, the economic contraction triggered by the coronavirus has been sudden and sharp. This steep slope on the downside reduces the possibility of the hard episode looking like a U. Similarly, on the upside, even a staggered reopening will statistically generate a steeper ascent of an extremely low base that would be characteristic of a U. What is a W-shaped economic recovery? This is so-called, uh, this is also called uh, double deep uh, shape. Under this scenario, the economic contracts recovers and then falls back into recession again. In this case, presumably due to a resurgence of the virus, while we certainly do not dispute the possibility, even probability of renewed outbreak later this year, our assumption is that a second wave or a third wave or subsequent waves would be more manageable. In addition to perhaps more widespread immunity, governments should be far, far better prepared with expansive testing better treatment, more medical supplies, and hospital beds. This preparedness should hopefully eliminate the need for blanket restrictions to be reinstated. While we believe a W can be avoided, uncertainty surrounding coronavirus leaves us most concerned about the risk of this scenario. As a matter of fact, the World Bank, in its outlook of the Philippines, also talk about the risk of, uh, of another D, right? What is an L-shaped economic recovery? This pattern is the most pessimistic and thankfully the most unlikely in our view. And this, under this scenario, the level of activity drops almost vertically and then essentially flat lines over the course of several years. To be sure, the shattering of global economies may deliver the initial downstroke. However, the, the sheer magnitude of the initial plunge dramatically increases the probability that at least some pickup in activity will be seen. Moreover, the widespread closure of national economies cannot be sustained indefinitely. The economic cost and the social backlash will be too great. A tipping point exists, exists where the challenge of uh, business shifts from short and whether companies can survive in the face of curtailed activity. That window may be one to three months after which either some rebound is seen or real GDP falls further. What is a swoosh economic recovery or base case? It's kind of an italicized V, right? That's what we're calling it though. 
It's also known as the swoosh. This is our base case, a steeper gradient on the downside, then a partially bounce, followed by a more, more gradual recovery. While the old adage, the larger the fall, the higher the bounce, is tempting to consider, the second half rebound is unlikely to recoup all of the losses generated in the first half of 2020 and 2021. Now, specific to uh, COVID the recovery forecast, let me share with you this slide. <clears throat> and there are three sections here. First one is uh, coming from uh, World Bank's uh, recent uh, World Bank's report uh, published in June 2021 about the uh, Philippine economic update. So first, the recent developments. The recent economic and policy developments, the economy remained in recession, contracting by 4.2% year on year in the first quarter of 2021. The growth contraction was fueled by weak domestic demand, driven by the combination of containment measures, weak confidence, and rising inflation. Meanwhile, tepid external demands was driven by the sharp contraction in services exports amid lingering restrictions and weak demand for international tourism while goods exports recovered. The public sector was the main driver of growth in the The impact of the recession is broad-based, affecting all sectors, uh, I, uh, such as industries, construction, construction, manufacturing services, trade, transportation, accommodation, and food services. Banco Central maintain, maintained its key policy rate at 2% throughout the first four months of 2021 to support the economic recovery. And uh, the authorities, the government also accelerated public spending uh, via stimulus spending and infrastructure investment. Uh, this too drove public spending from 19.4% of GDP in the first quarter of 2020 to 23.4% of GDP in the same period in 2021. Uh, as a result, the, the unemployment rate decreased to 7.1% in March after remaining steady at 8.7 uh, to 8.8% .8 in the past five months. So, Considering, considering this recent development, still uh, the World Bank is still looking at the growth prospect, uh, looking at uh, growth, you know, looking at growth. The growth prospect, uh, prospects hinge on the country's ability to manage the COVID-19 health crisis. Uh, secondly, the economy is pro uh, projected to expand at 4.7% in 2021 before accelerating to 5.9% in 2022 and then 6.0% in 2023. The economic recovery will contribute to renewed progress in poverty reduction. Growth prospects are subject to significant downside risks. Right? Uh, the first uh, risk is uh, a possible resurgence of infection due to, in, to the entry of new virus variants which may yet overwhelm the healthcare system. Secondly, in effectively containing the virus or implementing the mass vaccine, uh, ineffective in uh, implementing the mass vaccination program. That may extend mobility restrictions, which could lead to further job and income losses, disrupt businesses and delay economic recovery. External risks include a slower than expected global recovery disruptions in international logistics and global value chains and trade protectionism. On the upper right of this slide, you would see uh, the e economic recovery depending on uh, the industries. The good thing is if we scan the breadth of industry types, you would see some gainers. The gainers would be in the areas of health you know, because people are now more health conscious. The areas of digital, uh, like uh, online shopping, right? Uh, 
uh, uh, digital uh, digital solutions to uh, expense reporting or digital solutions to invoice processing. Pharma is uh, also gaining because of the need for uh, medicines. Cleaning, uh, basically because people uh, are more are more inclined to uh, sanitize uh, any surface uh, which can be suspected of uh, uh, harboring the coronavirus. Food, definitely, uh, everyone has to eat. Online uh, retail is also there, so uh, like Lazada, Shopee, etc. Unfortunately, there would be low performers as well. Hospitality will be part of it. Uh, the hotels, right? Uh, tourism, our resorts, sports. Uh, although uh, some uh, uh, big events are already happening, like the boxing, uh, uh, MMA, uh, basketball, etc. But uh, it's not gonna be as uh, as uh, open as before. Textile uh, is uh, low performing because people can. Uh, uh, can afford to wear one polo shirt for the whole week, right? <laughs> because of the work from home. Airlines, definitely, because of uh, religious travel, as well as apparels. All the rest would be kind of uh, there in the middle. So the, the, the economic recovery is kind of a mix across the uh, industries. I am uh, just... Uh, uh, thankful that uh, our industry, uh, the company where I, I'm uh, connected now, is really in the utilities part, and uh, uh, it's kind of like uh, it's equivalent to food. People always need water, so uh, uh, we can survive. The third uh, section is about the world, the world recovery. So uh, again, this is uh, from World Bank. No? Uh, the, but this time, uh, this report was cut, uh, was uh, published only in January uh, 2021. So the Philippine outlook was more recent. Uh, but for the world, actually, if you know, uh, they are putting in an outlook like a V, uh, a V curve, right? So uh, uh, the reason for that was that uh, 2020 was not uh, as much hit as it was predicted. No? So the, there, was, there was a hit uh, given the uh, lockdowns, but uh, we still uh, grew. We, uh, uh, globally, we still grew uh, primarily because of the uh, faster recovery in China. Okay. Uh, uh, was a pretty decent, no, around uh, 2 to 3 percent. And then uh, in 2021, uh, 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 it will dip and then it will uh, rise again in 2022. So it's kind of a, a, a V-curve here. The, the assumption is a 4 percent in 2021 predicated on proper pandemic management and effective vaccination limiting the community spread of COVID-19 in many countries. All right. Lastly, uh, I just want to include this, uh, not part of the uh, typical uh, economic uh, recovery curves. Uh, the new uh, fear now is about the K-curve. It's a big watch out. So uh, after the uh, COVID lockdowns, uh, definitely the economy uh, uh, went, went into recession. Uh, and then as we reimagine and reopen, there would be a split of growth. For professionals, there would be a positive growth. Everyone else, uh, there, there could be a lower growth or it can still be uh, going to recession. Technology, large, uh, large caps, uh, white collar you know, uh, growth there. Cyclical, small business, uh, uh, 
the poor and the blue collar, they may be affected and the, the curve may be going down. The positive news is that sometime in the future, there would be convergence again, right? Because the, the higher curve of uh, the upper uh, class could affect also the uh, lower class and uh, somehow pull them up. And uh, the lower curve of the uh, blue collar and the small businesses can actually also pull down the, the uh, upper class. So there might be some level of convergence somewhere. It's a, it's a big watch out really in our society because uh, uh, if uh, people will be thinking about themselves uh, rather than the holistic uh, betterment of uh, society and uh, humanity, uh, the same thing can really be true. And as a, a practical illustration, maybe you can think about uh, the availability of vaccines to countries. Some, some countries, uh, some producing countries uh, do export some of their uh, uh, vaccines, while some countries actually uh, has a policy of uh, vaccinating themselves first before others. So that kind of, uh, that kind of attitude actually is uh, one that can really, uh, that can really facilitate the happening of the K curve. Finally, let's switch gears one last time and this time take the intersection of the three circles. In reading through this economic recovery from COVID-19, please allow me to offer the following tips. First, be engaged. Get involved in disaster resilience planning and exercises. Know the emergency response procedures and volunteer to reimagine new normals. Here we can really adapt. Uh, we, we can really tap on uh, our characteristics of being versatile. My example in uh, Manila is that I, uh, I, I was tapped as a, a leader facilitator for utilities of the future uh, undertaking in the company. So, so piloting the framework that was uh, created by World Bank. So uh, there, were, there were eight countries uh, uh, selected to pilot the utilities of the future and we adapted, uh, we were part of that uh, eight countries and uh, my NILAD was one. So I facilitated that and part of the uh, uh, diagnostics and action plan was on the area of um, resiliency. Uh, the other example would be, uh, another uh, personal example would be on uh, a technical working group uh, where uh, Manila, uh, which Manila created. Uh, I actually uh, also uh, accepted that to be the leader of that group for reimagining and redefining the new normal. Uh, how how the work arrangement uh, should be done in, in our company, how much remote, how much on-site uh, work should be done, uh, what would be the uh, new workspace that should uh, that can uh, match with the with with the work arrangement, uh, those type of types of things. How can we how can we help the company cope up with the uh, uh, both the financial challenge uh, that the pandemic brings as, as well as the uh, uh, health and mental, uh, sorry, uh, uh, medical and mental. We can, uh, we can certainly uh, this time, these types of things. <clears throat> Secondly, hold the fort. Be there to prevent the fall and to ensure the rise. Why? Because, because of matrix of support. Uh, if, if each one of us tries to hold the, uh, to hold the port, then basically 
we will avoid further slide down of the economy. And U versus V is when some party fails to hold forth. So the difference between the U and the V, if you notice, it's really at the lower side. The U is a, is a long and a, a slow uh, increase versus V is a sharp increase. So uh, that's really because of uh, some party failing to hold the court. And how do we do this? First, we love our job. No? Just love our job. We are fortunate to be in a, in, in, uh, in a company or uh, with a business. We are fortunate to have that source of income right now. So uh, we have to uh, love our job and uh, find ways uh, where we can contribute. We can prepare for alternate uh, qualifications. Uh, chemical engineers usually, uh, some, uh, most chemical engineers have uh, worked on uh, uh, qualifying alternate suppliers for chemicals, for example, or for uh, process uh, equipment, for example. So uh, we know that there would be a supply, uh, there will, there are supply chain disruptions. So therefore we need to uh, be proactive uh, by uh, preparing alternate uh, suppliers. Health inefficiency drive to help uh, your company. And so uh, uh, the old culture of uh, um, you know, uh, trying to think uh, for ourselves may not be as, uh, as um, as uh, fitting now, we need to be thinking of how to how to really help the company uh, be uh, more efficient. And third is innovate to adapt. Uh, they say they say uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So uh, we need to uh, make use of the fact that uh, there's difficulty in disasters. There's a struggle in economic recovery and let that drive uh, innovation. So uh, actually, I, I would like to cite an example here uh, from Aniruddha Pandit. Uh, he shared this in TEDx uh, in Mumbai. <clears throat> uh, he talked about uh, what can we learn from uh, shrimps, well, snapping shrimps. And uh, the, the necessity in, in their environment was that uh, uh, manual uh, hand pump were common uh, in that uh, vicinity. And uh, uh, there were several cases or there, were, there was a high case of uh, waterborne diseases in the community. So uh, basically uh, they were able to uh, look at uh, the analogy of a snapping shrimp, right? Uh, because uh, that snapping shrimp uh, uh, needs to prey on other uh, fishes or other uh, organisms under the sea. But uh, its uh, capture rate uh, because of its uh, size of the claw is not, not really high uh, if uh, it intends to uh, capture its prey just by mechanical way. So what it does really is uh, snap its uh, claw uh, very quick in such a way that the water will uh, uh, have a high velocity and uh, draw a lower pre pressure at that uh, portion of the water. And that low, low pressure will be uh, enough to reach the vapor pressure so therefore, the water can become vapor uh, at a portion of, of the water body. And, but since there's a pressure also of the sea, right, because of the depth, the same vapor will immediately collapse. And that uh, collapse of the vapor actually can uh, create the energy needed to raise the temperature at uh, in the localized area to almost 10,000 uh, uh, 10, Kelvin. 
And that actually can stun or at least uh, that can kill or at least stun the uh, prey. No? And then the stopping shrimp has uh, now his time to actually capture his prey. So thinking about that kind of mechanism, uh, Aniruda actually uh, examined the hand pump and uh, was able to reapply the same uh, concept where he put, he put a mechanism inside the hand pump such that the water uh, the, such that the water coming from the ground uh, when flowing through that uh, mechanism will, uh, will travel at a very high uh, velocity, creating a lower uh, uh, pressure enough for, uh, uh, for some of the water to uh, turn into vapor. And then the rest of the water will tend to uh, uh, put pressure on it and uh, thereby uh, create cavitation. And that cavitation will uh, uh, generate, uh, generate energy enough to kill the microbes uh, in the water. And they have uh, tested this and uh, they have validated uh, uh, the uh, impact of it uh, uh, before and after comparison, both of uh, microorganisms presence in water and also on the uh, impact in terms of cases of uh, water waterborne diseases, and they were actually successful in doing so. Um, so, the the type of innovation that's uh, shown here is actually not not the point. Uh, it's not the, the the main point. The main point really is about uh, uh, considering uh, marrying our uh, marrying what we know, our knowledge, with uh, what uh, the environment has. In their case, they have a lot of uh, uh, manual pumps. And the problem, and the problem driving uh, the innovation. And in their case, the problem was uh, waterborne diseases in the community. And it can, uh, it can surface quite differently in uh, different organizations. Uh, during during disasters and economic re recovery, but uh, let's uh, think about it. We need to innovate continuously. This is who we are as chemical engineers. Uh, so for those uh, people and under uh, or working in technology selection and design for facilities and process lines, and even for those not in the function of technology selection, we can still innovate in simpler things on how we operate, example, frequency of cleaning and chemical usages on how we do work, of being digital, paperless, and remote, remote work. For self-care, so uh, this is very important uh, uh, step we should also be doing uh, during uh, disasters and uh, economic recovery because we also have our threshold. We also have our limits. So we really need to ensure that uh, we take care of ourselves as well. There are at least uh, three areas that I can uh, share with you. One is that uh, we need to be uh, we need to protect ourselves from the virus. Right, uh, follow the uh, quarantine procedures. Um, use mask, uh, face shields. Uh, sanitized often, and uh, most of all, uh, avail of uh, vaccination, right? Uh, it's about, uh, it's not just protecting our own selves, but also uh, protecting our families and friends. Secondly, we cultivate mental and physical wellness. So there's a lot of time now uh, in, uh, while uh, uh, doing remote work, uh, for us to do this. No? So we can actually uh, uh, do runs, we can uh, walk the dogs, uh, or uh, do anything uh, like uh, biking in, within, your, within your close vicinity, etc. And lastly, feed our mind and soul. No? So uh, it's a uh, time to read, 
uh, nowadays, right? So and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, opportunities. There's a lot of uh, uh, products uh, sold. So in, in my case, actually, I availed of Master Gold. So it, there's a, a five thousand plus uh, digital magazines available, and the cost is very low. No? Uh, versus buying uh, magazines and books uh, uh, weekly. So uh, here, here is a, a package already of Monster Gold. So there's a lot of uh, reading uh, materials there and uh, information. Of course, there are a lot of webinars such as this during this time. No? So we can avail of that. So uh, let, uh, let's take, take care of, us, of ourselves. That's a, uh, if uh, if ourself if we don't function uh, well, then uh, basically we cannot do uh, the work that chemical engineers uh, need to do. And finally, let us each be a force of good. This is my last slide before I end. Just uh, fitting. Let me share my own personal quote, my personal belief. Good deeds are their own reward but good tidings naturally flow to those who need to be rewarded. Ladies and gentlemen, we are people before we were engineers and we are still persons now that we are chemical engineers. As people, let's side with the force of good. Do, doing good is a reward by itself because of the fulfillment that we get from it. Besides, just like a drop of water in a big pond, it shall create ripples that can impact a bigger area. And if such drop is followed by others, the ripples may cover the whole pile and what a wonderful sight we can see. Personally, I have really tried to live by my coat as displayed. I make it a point to be a force of good and I am so grateful life has taken care of me throughout. Let me share a couple of blessings that I have enjoyed in the recent past. One is the uh, gift of scholarships. My wife and I have five kids. The eldest, Ian, has graduated in uh, UPD, is now working in software development as a COO, and has his own family already. My second and third, uh, Jan and Hazel, are college students, both studying in UP. One civil engineering and the other speech comm student. The fourth and fifth, uh, actually, well, the fourth, has graduated from a uh, state university already and is now in college. And the uh, fifth is still in, uh, in uh, a state university studying uh, senior high. So I am so happy to share that other than their living expenses, I have not paid for any tuition fees for the past couple of years. Second is uh, the gift of my NILA, the gift of uh, employment. So I, I went out of a corporate uh, work uh, in the past because of uh, of needing to uh, be in our family more and uh, uh, meanwhile I also I also uh, established some uh, business businesses uh, on my own uh, and just before the uh, pandemic uh, I was invited to uh, to uh, join my knee life Finally, when after meeting the the leaders there, uh, charismatic leaders, then uh, I made the decision to join. Uh, also, partially because uh, it was uh, about process excellence, which is also my passion. Uh, but uh, what I uh, I really wanna share is that uh, uh, a couple of months later, uh, African swine flu uh, actually hit on our. Uh, piggery, one of our businesses. And then the lockdowns actually uh, stopped uh, the operation of our uh, um, call this, uh, test, the, test the school training center in East Visayas. Uh, also stopped the operations in uh, my wife's uh, gown shop. You know? So uh, nobody's partying anymore. So nobody's uh, uh, needing uh, special gowns and uh, suits. So uh, I was really thankful that uh, uh, God uh, gave me these blessings. I shall continue to be with the force of good regardless of the rewards. 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. I do hope I have left uh, with I le I have left you with hope and strength for this unprecedented crisis we are now facing. I do hope I have given you the nuggets of thoughts that can take us chemical engineers to be at the forefront of this economic recovery. A pleasant afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Engineer Walter Emnase, virtual club, everyone. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Engineer Walter, for your insightful talk regarding disaster resilience and economic recovery. So uh, it's, a, it's a highlight that governments or states should be more focused and invest more in technical analysis for disasters and prevention itself. So alam yun na sa darating na election po next year. So it's also, you also highlighted no, chemical engineers as leaders in our own ways in times of these disasters, no, sa pandemic itself. And I remembered a quote from your slide which says, which highlighted the importance of interdependence than just independence itself. So we, we need to collaborate with other engineering fields as well. So thank you, Engineer Walter, for gracing your afternoon with us. Thank you, thank you. So just a reminder for everyone who are still with us this afternoon. So it's not over yet. We still have another uh, event. We still have another section of this program after this. We have a center stage, CHE center stage with uh, Janice Chua, Engineer Janice Chua, aka Nina Bonita, which is the fun side of being a chemical engineer. So abangan yun kasi October, we, they will tackle somewhat like of the October fest. So baka may tagay mamaya. Also, please do fill up the learning assessment form. I think, uh, Mr. Prasim, can you share with us the link again for the learning assessment form? This would be the basis for your certificate of attendance later. So make sure to check the spelling of your names so that we can issue properly your certificate of attendance. Please complete the evaluation. Thank you, thank you. Also, um, we will be having our Q&A. So sa mga may tanong dyan, please put them on the chat box. So we have a few questions already. So shall we start now with a question and answer? Okay, Lamba, Mr. President. Shall we proceed with a question and answer? Uh, I-show muna natin yung poll results. Uh, ah, okay, we'll start with the poll. So, uh, before on the onset and on the during the seminar, we have polls. No? So, ito, I'll show you one by one. Are you seeing the poll results already there? Can they see on their end also, Mr. President, the poll results? Yes. Yeah. Okay. First poll was, did you know that Jeffrey Hidalgo, the Filipino singer, is also a chemical engineer? So most of the answer says, I'm surprised. Ako siguro, I don't know him. Hindi ko alam. No offense. Pero sino po ba si Jeffrey Hidalgo? I, I somewhat heard it somewhere, no? But I'm not really familiar with him. He's a member of the Smoky Mountain first batch. Ayun. Kasi nga si engineer generation. Anong generation? No, just kidding, just kidding. So... Ayan. Let's proceed with the next question. Ayan. So the second poll was, how do you characterize yourself as a leader? You can choose more than one. Ayan. Most of the answers, majority executor. Next is young envisioner and then engager. So envisioner and executor ang top two, maybe I would like to compare it with those people working in the design for the envisioner and dito sa mga manufacturing operations naman sa executor. So, yan. So, leaders, chemical engineers as leaders. Ayan. Number, uh, third poll was, based on the resilience model, where do you think as a chemical engineer can contribute most at the moment? Majority of the answer is prevention. Maybe this is disaster prevention. Secondly, it's uh, preparation for interventions. So ito na yung mga hazard, hazard risk analysis. Then followed by intervention, Ayan. preparedness. And our fourth poll. Next. Which of these DR and ER, disaster resilience and economic recovery contributions, have you taken a role within your niche? Most of the answers goes to self-care at 
uh, as sa, sa UAE nga, sabi nga, we are all responsible to self-care. So secondly, there's also innovated to adapt. As chemical engineers, we can conform and be flexible and versatile. Ayan. Thank you for everyone who participated with the poll. So it's fun and we learned something new for this afternoon. Now, all the questions are in. Now we can ask our distinguished speakers some of our some of the questions, no? So I'm going to open my chat box for a while. So I'll start now. Engineer Walter, are you ready? I'll try. Okay. So okay, let's start with this one. This is a question from. Uh, this is a question from. Wait, uh, I'm having a difficulty looking, scrolling down. From Miss Sonia Ibarra Buscano uh, to Sir Walter, bridging the gap between the academe and industry needs. In this pandemic time, can you recommend any undertaking that will replace the industry, industrial internship or yung tinatawag na OGT for CHE students? No? So for the final years in the academe. Ayan. Yeah, I think that that uh, area of discussion has always been uh, a subject of uh, discussions also in other forums. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's an area that uh, we can continuously innovate as well, right? Uh, just speaking uh, uh, my mind freely, I think uh, there has to be uh, a feedback loop on uh, how, how well the new professionals, new chemical engineers are uh, satisfying or uh, creating value in the company uh, where they're working on and uh, feeding that back to uh, the educators and let the educators think of the strategies rather than the industries dictating how they should uh, perform. No, so, so the accountability is, is still present in, in uh, the uh, educational institutions, but uh, the feedback loop is there uh, in terms of uh, how, how it's performing. But the other piece is also, uh, even though it's not uh, the uh, industry's uh, uh, responsibility or accountability, they can also uh, suggest. You know? So uh, given, given the current, uh, the, given the current, uh, trends in uh, the industry, uh, how, how else, uh, what else should be included in the uh, uh, curriculum. So that kind of uh, a mechan mechanism should be there. Uh, of course, uh, the, old, the old practice of uh, internship, of uh, plant visits, um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, not because it's an old uh, technique, uh, we, we can forego it. Uh, I think we should still continue with internship. Uh, we, can, uh, we can still continue with uh, the uh, summer plant visits of uh, the fourth year chemical engineers going, uh, engineering students rather, going to fifth year, they uh, visit a lot of plants. We can continue with that with, uh, technique and couple that with uh, continuous communication between uh, industries and uh, educators. Okay. So you're saying that uh, there's a chance for this uh, OGT to evolve no? in a more digital way. No? We can be open for that. Would that be a possibility in the future? Uh, uh, certainly, yes, because uh, even the the workers now are uh, kind of following a hybrid system. So uh, if that's applicable for uh, the real employees, then certainly it can also be applicable to uh, interns. So, but the hybrid systems uh, will, will still require some uh, on-site attendance of, uh, of the students in, in the company. Right? But uh, most of the work will be done remotely, probably 
one day or two days a week uh, in in the in the plant or in the laboratory or in a research facility yeah. and then uh, the rest of the days uh, are still uh, remote yeah yeah thank you thank you sir our next question let's move on uh, we have a, a few so we have from uh, our president engineer Hilbert Libres I'm just curious you working in my lad no were there higher water demands during the hard lockdowns in the Philippines There's actually, um, thanks for that question, uh, Bert. No? Uh, there's actually a mix of uh, um, dynamics. The first one is that uh, people tend to uh, tend to wash more, uh, take a bath more. So uh, the the personal demands uh, per person uh, is a, a bit higher. Uh, However, the domestic, uh, uh, sorry, the, the commercial uh, uh, establishments are of reduced hours. Now, there are days that they don't operate. So basically, uh, total demand from uh, the commercial establishment has uh, gone down. And uh, the third dynamic is that uh, uh, People are actually trying to go to the outskirts already. Uh, some some people also went to, uh, went back to the provinces. Uh, yung balik provincia uh, program dati ng, ng government. So that one also reduced the total number of consumers. So if we just look at uh, 20, uh, 20, 20, sorry, 2020 versus 2019, there was a, indeed a reduction. No, so, so the, the downward uh, um, dynamics actually overcome the upward dynamics. So a reduction overall? Yeah, a, a total net reduction. Okay, okay. Good insight. Now we have another question. Now it's from uh, Engineer Florenzo, Florencio Lopez Jr. What are the main challenges to convert the Sendai framework for dis disaster risk reduction to a list of defined actions? So from a bigger framework to a smaller framework, no? That's what I understood. Convert the Sendai framework for disaster Sorry, risk uh, to a list of defined actions, yes. To tend to... Uh, sorry, Chris, can you repeat the question again? Uh, okay. It comes here a little bit choppy. Okay, I'll repeat it for you. What are the main challenges to convert the Sendai framework for the Hello, can you hear me well? Did you chop? Hello? Okay, I'll repeat it once more. What are the main challenges to convert the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction to a list of defined actions? Example, for COVID pandemic in the Philippines. All right, uh, th thank you for that one. So I am also following this now via chat as well. Uh, apologize, maybe it's because of my signal. Um, well, the, the main challenges, uh, because uh, the question is uh, relate, related to COVID as well. Uh, the main challenge is that uh, the whole Sendai framework is uh, for the total uh, set of disasters. And uh, the health aspect of that uh, has, has uh, kind of uh, taken a step back uh, and uh, just followed suit when uh, there was a there was a convention in uh, Bangkok so it was kind of late uh, so while while the total Sendai uh, was uh, being worked on in uh, early 2010 uh, the uh, health uh, aspect has been uh, started to be worked on in 2015 so so while the uh, well, the actions uh, done were more about uh, earthquake, typhoon, uh, extreme temperature, landslide. Uh, the actions for the health uh, uh, risk reduction. Relatively uh, new. Pandemic 
by Basas taken a uh, kind of a, a slow uh, startup there. Uh, so that's the, that's the challenge. Uh, there was a, a lag in terms of implementation or uh, the, the thinking of the program. Uh, a lag between the uh, physical uh, disasters and the health. And then uh, the second part of the question was uh, uh, about okay. converting the Sendai framework uh, to a defined action. You know? So, so uh, I think from a bigger plate, uh, the four priority actions of uh, the Sendai framework are really actions, right? However, uh, in terms of uh, each country, uh, each country will have to uh, look at its own hazards and risks. You know? So uh, put some uh, uh, thinking there. Uh, there are, uh, there are uh, tools and techniques that can be used like high rock. You know? uh, uh, countries can use high rock so that they will un uh, understand better the hazards present in our uh, uh, each country and then um, uh, list down the control actions that uh, need to be uh, put in place. Yeah. So I think that is uh, the one missing and, and uh, it's a continuous uh, journey because uh, even right now uh, we have we have that uh, national uh, uh, disaster, what was that, uh, in DRCC? Uh, I forgot the acronym. NDRCC. Uh, so uh, the communication piece is already there. So they have identified that uh, the uh, push button mode of uh, relief uh, services, they have also identified that uh, the form of uh, the relief uh, goods uh, to make it easier to be transported instead of bags, uh, put that in boxes so that uh, they can carry more per truck. Uh, things like that are have been, which are actually the concrete actions uh, which, uh, which is an example of the question. So uh, those, uh, those types of actions have uh, already kind of uh, started in, uh, in the committee's thinking. So, uh, but it's, it's still a continuous uh, journey. And I think uh, uh, HIRA can, can help our uh, committees there. Yes, yes, I understand. So you're saying that it's a bigger umbrella, this Senpai framework, and we can still use the traditional methods, for example, Hira, Casa, Paso, and any other types of methods that we have been using for years and years already, because this is a relatively new framework. Yes, and uh, the part of the uh, answer is that uh, it's already happening as well. Uh, but it's a journey. Uh, it will never be perfect. You know? So we have to uh, keep on learning. He has another question. Do you think that Philippines is allocating enough bud budget and focus on the disaster risk reduction, especially on the emergency preparedness for the uh, Philippines? Personally, uh, I think no. Uh, I think the my, my personal opinion is that uh, the uh, bill about uh, from, uh, pushing for a separate department on uh, disaster uh, risk reduction. So the depart department of forget uh, disaster or something like that. So uh, instead of uh, having agencies scattered all over uh, different departments, uh, group them together and uh, focus on. Uh, uh, preventing the disaster to happen, uh, uh, educating the people. So I think uh, we need to uh, to push for that uh, deal. But a, a lot of the representatives and sen uh, senators are uh, of the thinking uh, that that's needed. No? Uh, so it's just uh, other matters are overtaking in terms of uh, prioritization of uh, uh, discussing or covering the bills. Looking at the diagram that you have shown earlier about Senpai framework, what do you think is the weakest link or the weakest part throughout those actions na hindi na overlook na overlook ng Philippines as of the moment for COVID? 
Hmm, that's a good question. And I haven't uh, thought of that before. <clears throat> but maybe... But, 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 uh, yeah, but uh, probably it's really about uh, uh, infrastructure. You know, uh, yeah. Because uh, coming from uh, very limited resources, people tend to uh, build something that uh, they can call their own houses no? yeah. but uh, and those uh, how properties may be uh, falling on the fault line and should be built uh, better uh, with better standards so I, I think uh, and uh, that's probably uh, the reason why uh, the country is uh, the government is uh, uh, putting out the information about the geo hazards uh, Mm. in certain regions so that uh, we can avoid uh, putting properties there, put, putting, out, putting up houses and uh, buildings. And if we still put ones, then we better make uh, them uh, zone, for, uh, zone for resistance. Okay, thank you, engineer. Uh, let's go with the last set of questions from Carlo Biole. With the on and off quarantine or lockdown in most parts of the country, does the Philippines COVID-19 response plan working? I'll repeat, with the on and off quarantine or lockdown in most parts of the countries, does the Philippines COVID-19 response plan working? Ah, okay, so uh, I think, uh, sorry, uh, I don't want to uh, side uh, um, any po political parties now, but, uh, just objectively, let me answer this. And there, there has to be some disconnect uh, in terms of uh, uh, expecting an on and off quarantine uh, lockdown to be uh, a result of uh, poor execution or poor uh, or ineffective work of the response plan. I, I think there, there are, just like uh, what we have talked about uh, when we uh, took uh, when we talk about uh, disaster, there's uh, there's some work that we need to uh, mitigate or um, we need to manage, but there are uh, other factors that are outside our control, like uh, yeah. uh, it, uh, like the virus, uh, the different variants of the virus, uh, and then the on and off can be related to that. Uh, the on and off uh, can also be viewed as uh, something uh, where the where where the government is uh, really implementing and monitoring. Not so because that's a cycle. You you plan, you uh, do, you check, you act, right? So if you don't, if you do some on and off, that means to say you are uh, you are doing checking and acting, right? So, uh, so in a way, that's a uh, uh, manifestation of that. Mm. Uh, and it would somehow while uh, like... sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, telling that it somehow reflects with the economic curves that you're showing about restrictions being uh, placed and removed with the respect to the economic curve. Correct, sir. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So. Uh, on and off can be the result of the situation. Uh, and the situation can be a result of either what's in our control and uh, what is uh, outside our control. So, so there you have it from an objective standpoint, uh, an on and off can be an, uh, a sign of uh, being an effective program uh, or uh, it can also be a sign that there is a, a miss in the uh, response plan. Okay, thank you. Now the last question, what chemical engineering sector will boom as the pandemic continues and what will not boom? That was from Carlo Biole. Are there loss of opportunities or more of uh, good opportunities for us chemical engineers? Your thoughts, sir? Yes, uh, Chris. So I, I think uh, I covered that uh, a bit in uh, in terms of uh, the forecast for industries, the types of industries. 
So, uh, sectors where chemical engineers work uh, on uh, healthcare, uh, on uh, digital, uh, on food, and uh, utilities, those would, uh, those would actually uh, boom, you know, are actually uh, booming. So, uh, but uh, those that are uh, connected to uh, hospitality, uh, to apparel, etc., uh, will will uh, be affected uh, temporarily. Okay, that's true. So once again, thank you so much, Engineer Walter M. Nasset. Thank you for gracing us this afternoon. At sa mga lahat na nag-participate, sa lahat ng uh, viewers, and up until now, wag na wag muna kayong aalis. We still have another section of this program which is the gender stage a fun side of chemical engineers where we got to talk about um somehow related din sa atin but the funny side of us 